Technology and Filmmaking at BART, it is my pleasure to introduce Medic and Assembly. Thank you so much, Khaled, and the entire Howe team for having me here. It's really an honor to be here and be able to present to you all at uh, Howe Talks. So today I'm going to talk about land. I'm going to talk about the way land is governed. I'm going to talk about the history of certain pieces of land. And I'm going to talk about the communities that often live and struggle invisibly on those lands. Now, the American Indian Reservation and the Palestinian Refugee Camp are both exceptional spaces. They're spaces defined by a unique history of territorial displacement. They are spaces often of deprivation and hardship. And they are also spaces that bear a unique and troubled relationship to the countries in which they are located. The Palestinian refugee camps were established after the Nakba in 1948. They were established in five areas, in the then newly created states of Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and in the Palestinian territories of the West Bank and Gaza. Gaza itself consists of several enormous refugee camps, and many of you might not know, but 80% of the population of Gaza are in fact refugees. So since 1948, you have Palestinian refugee camps amidst other Palestinians in Palestine. Now this Palestinian refugee crisis is not only the result of Israeli settler colonialism, but is also the result of the creation of the modern nation states in the Middle East after the fall of the Ottoman Empire after World War I. That's why a Palestinian from northern Galilee could be considered a stranger in southern Lebanon, not more than 30 kilometers away from where he was born. Now, the Palestinian refugee camps are defined more than anything else by a lack of space and a lack of privacy because they were built under the logic of the emergency. They were built under the assumption that these people were going to go back to the land from which they came, not unlike how we regard the Syrian refugees today. And, I, and it's this lack of space that leads to the current miserable situations within the camps. And I saw this firsthand when I visited Ain al-Halwi in Saida, the largest Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. This is a place where someone sells drugs 15 meters away from a mosque where one brother who's a communist and the other brother who's an Islamist may have an argument in, in the streets. Where when you get married, you move to another room in the very same house where your parents and grandparents live. Where I interviewed the leader of one faction, walked 15, minute, 15 meters outside the office, and found the leader of the rival faction sitting there eating hummus, and then I interviewed him as well. Uh, <laughs> So, and no wonder with these kinds of cramped conditions that oftentimes violence erupts between the various factions in these camps. And there is actually currently a brutal civil war raging in Ain al Halwe, self-enclosed within the confines of those camps. And for people to live lives of dignity, most Palestinians to live lives of dignity in those spaces is truly, truly exceptional. Now on the reservation side, I'm going to provide you with two anecdotes from two of the reservations I visited that illustrate the importance of land in defining native sovereignty and uh, tribal sovereignty. In the first case, you have the territory of the Black Hills. Gold, the Black Hills are for the Lakota people of the Great Plains of America. It is their Garden of Eden. It is where their creation story takes place. But unfortunately for them, gold was discovered in the Black Hills. And in 1876, the U.S. Army intervened on behalf of those seeking gold and engaged in a military conflict with the Lakota people. And the Lakota tribes were, in a sense, defeated. But they were not defeated militarily. That's very important. How they were defeated was that the U.S. Army systematically annihilated the American buffalo. And in doing so, eradicated their economic and food base, forcing them into a material subservience to the United States. The Lakota people were placed onto different prisoner of war camps, which are today the reservations of Nevada and South Dakota and North Dakota. Um, that land, now the Black Hills was never returned to the Lakota people, but the United States government, recognizing the theft of that land, offered in 1880 to buy that land back for $101 million. The Lakota people refused the settlement. 
the land was, the money was transferred to a trust and is now worth a whopping $3.1 billion. And the Lakota people still refuse to accept that money. Now what you have to understand is that these reservations are among some of the poorest places in the United States. In Pine Ridge Reservation, where we went, the average life expectancy is 50 years of age. Unemployment stands above 80%. The infant mortality rate is five times the national average. So for these people to refuse that settlement is truly admirable and also an important illustration of how significant land is in understanding tribal autonomy and native autonomy. Now, the second example I'm going to give is from the Black Mesa. The Black Mesa is a part of the Navajo Nation, another reservation we visited, which is the largest reservation in the United States, both in population and in land. The Black Mesa has been traditionally inhabited by both the Hopi and Navajo people. But in 1974, under pressure from a coal company who was seeking to extract minerals from that land, the land was divided into an exclusively Navajo and exclusively Hopi section. And somewhere around 12,000 Navajo were displaced from the Hopi section of the land. And this is the largest displacement to take place in the United States of America since the 19th century. Now, some people refused to leave their land. And we had the honor of staying at one of these um, people's houses when we were there. The Navajo people in the Black Mesa don't have much money, but because they have a connection to their land and a traditional economy based on sheep and sheep herding, they are able to live lives of dignity. Without that land base, they become merely people without money living in an urban setting. And we can all imagine what that's like. So these people have refused to live their land, leave their land, and I'm sitting there talking to this Navajo matriarch who has had her bones broken numerous times by the Hopi police who are in the service of the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs. We're speaking through translation. She doesn't speak any English. Her, her daughter is translating from Diné into English. And I'm, and, and I'm telling her about the key. The physical keys that Palestinian refugees took with them when they left their homes in 1948. The physical reminder of the Palestinian right of return. And she breaks down crying, saying, I never knew there were other people who had to leave their homes and still carried the memories of their homes with them. And that's what I'm addressing here, is that the Palestinian refugee camp and the native reservation are essential in understanding tribal sovereignty and tribal and, uh, and essential in understanding autonomy and sovereignty within these communities. The Palestinian refugee camp is in many ways the cradle of the Palestinian struggle. It's the birthplace of both intifadas. It's the place where the contradictions that underlie Israeli, Palestinian, Lebanese society are most exposed. And most importantly, it's the living reminder of the right to return. Similarly, the native reservation symbolizes and, and stands for tribal attempts at maintaining indigenous ways of governance, tribal sovereignty, and a historic connection to their land. So what we have to understand is that I started by saying this is a story about land. It's more than that. It's a story about communities and a story about resilience. It's a story about people who live, work, get married, are born, raise families, die, and pass on an understanding of their identity and their history to a future generation. It's about a place where where these people come together and live a life that in one sense is a product of hardship and suffering, but in the other sense is a place where they refuse. They refuse to give up their identity and they refuse to give up their connection to their land. And that is worthy not of our pity, but it is worthy of our attention. It is worthy of our commitment and is most importantly worthy of our admiration. Thank you so much.